It wouldn't go over 40. <laughs> so he drove it like an old man? He is an old man. It was a badass <laughs> ride, though. Super fast Lamborghini is super expensive. Rick's offer for a holy grail of cars almost cost a customer his marriage. Sleek Ferrari proves too slippery for Rick's budget. A customer tries to cash out with Johnny Cash's car. Cars are expensive, but some are more expensive than others. And today, we'll be looking at the heights of luxuries brought into the store by customers. Luxury cars are, well, expensive, but the Lamborghini ranks as arguably one of the most expensive ones out there. This also means a limited clientele, but with the capacity to pay the fee, and Corey is about to join their ranks. Got a car outside that I think you might be interested in looking at. All right, I got a uh, lot back there. You just want to pull it around? All right, meet you out there. We've been getting a lot of cars in here lately, and I hope this one's good. Coming to the pawn shop today to sell my 2003 Lamborghini Murcielago. It's something that I've owned for two years, and uh, I really could use the money. For some people, owning a Lamborghini can be the ultimate status symbol. All right, so it's a Lamborghini. There's pretty much no frills in here. It's not built for luxury. It's nope. built for speed. No cup holders. Corey misses out on the fun of riding the car, but Johnny is just as competent and the best person to tell if the vehicle is all it should be. Beautiful, man. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, Corey. So what do you want to do with it exactly? I'm looking to sell it. And what are you looking to get out of it? I'd say around 115000 for it. <sighs> for a moment there, it looked like Corey would decide without an expert's opinion. Thankfully, he thought better of it. Imagine Rick coming in to find out he's hundred grand poorer. Now it still might go south because hundred grand is 90 degrees higher than his spending limit. I got you. I'll go do my own thing. That's what spawned Lamborghinis. The thing about Lamborghini more so than Ferrari is just the fact that they're over the top. They're just crazy. Would you mind firing it up? If I, I'd just love to hear it. Absolutely. That'd it's be good. great. That's like listening to Led Zeppelin's first record. And I'd have to put it somewhere around $90,000 would be my opinion. Dan shaves off 20 grand from the initial ask. But 90 grand is still a lot to part with, and Corey needs to negotiate well to get the best price. I just don't think I could do that. I'd uh, I'd go, you know, I'd go 110. Cheapest I've seen anybody is 130. I'm gonna have to stick at 95, man. I trust every word this guy tells me, and I'm going above what he's suggesting I pay for it. I could use the money, but um, you know, I think I'm gonna have to take it home, put it back in the garage. Muscle cars are high performance cars, and the Plymouth Barracuda is one of the most popular. Today, Rick's out to flex his money muscles in hopes of claiming a CUDA. A 1971 Plymouth Barracuda. So where's the CUDA? Through that door. The 1971 Plymouth Barracuda was at the pinnacle of muscle cars. Michael Keaton, 1992, Batman Returns. What kind of gas mileage does this thing get? I don't know. It's got JP5. It burns out the rear end, and that's where you get f six, eight feet of flame, so a lot. The car is fully equipped. It's got chin spoilers, a go wing, and a nice, healthy 340 motor. The car is just absolutely immaculate. The green giant belongs to John's wife and is used for the most unusual duty. Guess being around these cars is a norm for her. Can you imagine how cool it is to build and work with such beautiful vehicles? This has got to be a paradise for race car collectors. It's got the original motor and transmission, power brakes, power steering. I want it safe for my wife to drive. We'd get groceries in it. I mean, this was her daily driver. I'm super impressed. That is a beautiful engine. So how much are you looking for? Ready? Ready. 90. $90? Sounds good. It does sound really good. It drives good. It doesn't feel like super jerky sometimes when you get in a muscle car and you know you hit on the gas and it's like. After taking the car for a spin, Rick decides what he'll offer for it, which is a bit far from what John asks. He wouldn't go over 40. <laughs> so he drove it like an old man? He is an old man. It was a badass <laughs> ride though. 80,000 is pretty much it. I can't I can't go much lower than that. We do 70? Man, I can't swing it. This just I, I, I can't get that deep. With its limited production, the 1984 Ferrari 308 GTS is every car collector's dream. Rick can easily flip it for a nice profit if it's gotten at the right price. A guy called me at the shop and said he had a 1984 Ferrari back in the 80s. Every guy on the planet wanted this car. Quattro valve. Magnum PI special. You bet. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm a car collector, mostly interested in European cars. I bought the Ferrari from another collector in the Midwest. The car's features are just right, and Rick is impressed as well as his pocket will allow him to be. He is, after all, a businessman. But we've got to say, Roy isn't making it easy for him to remember that. Even back in the 50s, I mean, they were just the car to have. They looked beautiful. They, I mean, they kept on winning races. This is cool. Um, can I open the door? Absolutely. Go ahead. Because you know the engine's in the back. Engine right here. There's the beauty. V8, fuel injected, which is, you know, at its time, it's a, it's a leading technology. Do you mind if I call up a friend and take a look at this? Um, quite frankly, I don't know a lot about them, but I just know I want one. Okay. Bill speaks cars and has nothing but praises for the vehicle. At this point, Rick might not even get a buyer, but keep the Ferrari for himself. Although the old man might have had something to say about that. Well, there it is, the business end of this thing right here. This is what it's all about, that three liter V8. These things were screamers, man. I mean, Rick, you've brought me to see some turds. <laughs> this, I gotta call science fiction on that because I don't know if Tom Selleck was fitting, <laughs> fitting in this car. With this being a white car, it could actually hold a little higher value. I'd say this car is worth $75,000. That's close to Roy's initial ask, and the ensuing negotiation is brutal. Rick and Roy drive hard bargains, but they've got to meet in the middle to make the deal. You take 60? No, no. This has got nowhere to go but up. How about we go 77 and a half? <sighs> my, my really is my top dollar 63. I can't go that low. I'm okay. sorry. Thanks for letting me drive it. You know, it's not every day that somebody offers you a Rolls Royce, especially not one belonging to a famous person. So when a customer brings one to the Harrisons, it might be an offer that they just can't refuse. 1970 Rolls Royce Silver Shadow. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, that's the beautiful thing about a Rolls Royce. You know, when you see a Rolls Royce, you know it's a Rolls Royce. The Johnny Cash is a result of the success of the Johnny Cash Show in 1969. Luxury, history, and glam all in one car. Johnny Cash is one of the best-selling music artists of all time, and with fans around the world who will be willing to buy anything of his, even mobile real estate, Rick shouldn't have a hard time selling this one. This belonged to Johnny Cash. The man in black. The man in black, and this gentleman here was Johnny Cash's drummer. All right, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to believe that I've got the premier collectible of Johnny Cash in the world. Let me call up a buddy of mine. Steve needs no introductions with the car, because there's only one of it in the world. Things go pretty well with an assessment of the parts. After the test drive, all that's left is for Steve to decide how much Rick will get it for. Wow, Johnny Cash's Rolls Royce, huh? Doesn't get much cooler than that. Yeah, this is nice. The Rolls Royce always represented the higher echelon, even back, you know, in the 20s, the 70s, and even today, I think. This I gotta admit, I mean, this thing really drives well for a 1970 car. 31,000 original miles. I don't know if you know about this. Last year, another 1970 Rolls Royce, owned by Johnny Cash, went through auction for $49,500. And how many of these does one man need? It seems like if he is Johnny Cash, more than one. That valuation is a punch to Steve's gut, and this expensive ride might not be sold today. Thanks, Steve. Hey, my pleasure. Okay. And it was a pleasure meeting you. Hey, my pleasure. It really pleasure. was. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen, very much. We're obviously not going to make a deal, but it's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. And it's been an honor, sir. It's been an absolute my pleasure. Honor. My honor. Corey was skeptical of what he would face when he got called that a car awaited him outside. He could barely contain his amazement when he saw a Lamborghini drive into the parking lot. With this color palette, it's a complete ghost if it drives past at night with its lights off. Got a car outside that I think you might be interested in looking at. All right, I got a uh, lot back there. You just want to pull it around? All right, meet you out there. We've been getting a lot of cars in here lately, and I hope this one's good. Uh, I purchased it from the IRS at a federal auction. And just out of curiosity, what do you get this for at the IRS auction? I paid 111 for it. OK. Do you know why they build them this low? I really don't. People don't realize how hard it is to get a car to go 200 miles an hour. There's, what, maybe 10 production cars in the world that will do that speed? That's probably about right. As much as I would love to drive it, I don't think I'm going to fit in a thing. The test drive is done to determine the car's functionality. Factually, the Harrisons have a motto, if it doesn't ride, we don't pay. To see how much the Lamborghini has to offer in terms of luxury and state of mind, it'll all meet up to the standards that it sells. Unless they know it runs as good as it looks. Don't break it, Johnny. We haven't bought it yet. <laughs> Beautiful, man.
driving a Lambo is a dream come true. All right, we know it runs well. Uh, my question is, what is it really worth? Do you mind if I call somebody else down here to take a look at it? Yeah, that's not a problem. I'd be interested to see what he has to say. Let me make a few phone calls. Sounds good. The beauty of a Lamborghini is in the detailing. From the first glance of the eye to the first engine purr. The Lambo experience can never be forgotten. It's undoubtedly going to come back in a past life memory. So you're doing this on your own day. It's a pretty big deal. Old man's going to let you spend that kind of money? Yeah, I'm stepping it up a little bit. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to take a little control of this place. So. I love it, brother. Well, man, of course I want to know what you think it's worth and see if you can see anything wrong with it, because I sure as hell can't. Can we take a tour? We'll walk around this Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. Proper Lamborghini should be having a V12 in there. Would you mind firing it up? If I, I'd just love to hear it. Absolutely. That'd it's be good. great. Beauty's a thing, but it'll come down to the money, and that's all we're about in this episode. How much do you think this car should be worth? Beautiful. I got no complaints on the condition of this car. In today's market, I'd have to put it somewhere around... 85, maybe $90,000 would be my opinion. 95, I wouldn't go any higher. When you pull up, it's the used old model Lamborghini. And, I, and yeah, I'm not trying to- Yeah, but it's a cool old Lamborghini. It, it I is. Mean, come on, man. I'd go 100 grand. Yeah, I'm staying at 95, man. You know, it's a one of a kind when Rick says, you gotta be kidding me. We've got a Shelby GT350 as used in the movie Gone in 60 Seconds, doubling as a rare model supercar in a movie prop. This car should cost no less than 100,000. You gotta be kidding me. Shelby GT350, Gone in 60 Seconds, the movie. What made this car famous was the movie Gone in 60 Seconds with Nicolas Cage. They nicknamed the car Eleanor. That's why the car is worth more value today. There was right around 100 modifications that Shelby did to a Ford Mustang to make the GT350. The car's seen good days, but the maintenance has also been top notch. Now you can tell when you see an ordinary car owner from a car enthusiast. The care given is the best. Best believe that riding this around will be perfectly comfortable. This is clean. This is really nice. Ah, it looks all beautifully stock. That's what I like to see. My asking on the car is $125,000. I've done my homework on this car. I know the value of it. I feel it's a fair price what I'm asking for the car. Raise and lower the prices on these things. OK. OK, so right. let me get him down here. He will know every single thing there is to know about this car. You know it's a great car when two or more agree that it's a nice catch. Now, the GT350 should not be set aside because it ticks the mark for every dream car option a man would want in any aesthetic item. There it is, the Hypo 289, man. It looks like it's a, it's a pretty well-kept engine bay. You know, this is definitely a car that's been cherished, I can tell that. Be careful with my baby. car felt good. It's got really good power. You know that car would get the goods when you lay in the throttle. What do you think it's worth? Well, um, it's a solid car. Runs and drives good. 100 to 110,000 bucks. After the Shelby came the Chevy 2, named after its creator, Louis Chevrolet, who created these compact cars to rival the Ford and to give the satisfaction of a good muscle feel when behind the wheel of these babies. I know you like slick rides, so this is one slick ride. Okay, yeah, it's definitely cool, man. How long you had it? I've had it a few weeks. Have some fun with it, and now I'm thinking about doing a new project. The paint job is great. The body work on this thing is great. It all matches, it all flows together. Do you mind if I pop the hood open? Be my guest. It's an LS1 motor. Definitely a different dash. <laughs> Yeah, this is right out of Knight Rider. The body and engine of this one-of-a-kind Chevy makes it worth about $40,000 as his asking price, except Rake thinks otherwise if he'd look to get a good profit on the car. I really like it, but I think I'd have a hard time selling it. I mean, what do you want for it? I would think 40000 I can't do 40. I can't do 40. Either. Now Rick declines one Chevy and another one comes knocking at his doorstep. They're all that resilient to get into the pawn shop inventory, but one should give accolades to the inventors of the old model Chevys. They got plenty of kids happy. Now this Chevy's going for about 10,000. My 1960 Chevy Corvair. I like it. Would you like to hear the horn? Let's hear the horn. <laughs> slick looking car. This was a really innovative car. I mean, GM completely redesigned the car with this thing. What was so new and innovative about it? They came up with a radical new design that took chances and turned heads. Now items get valued based on the events surrounding them. And the OJ Simpson Bronco is one of the most recognizable vehicles for every household in the 90s to watch the chase on the news.
This is it. The OJ Bronco. <laughs> wow. It is the OJ Bronco. I own the white Ford Bronco. The murders were June 12th. OJ was supposed to turn himself in on the morning of the 17th. He didn't. There's some people that were going to sell the Bronco to a company called, I think it's Graveline Tours, and they were going to go up and down the freeway, go by the murder site, and I just thought that'd be classless, especially since the trial hadn't started yet. Now, OJ definitely left his mark on everybody who watched that whole nonsense unfold, and Rick is kind of surprised that the SUV's getting sold, but the real shock is hearing how much it's going to cost him to get his hands on it. About 36000 So is that the same license plate that was on it when... Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, if you pull up photos, you'll see AC sitting here. Right. So where were you at during the chase? Oddly enough, I was behind the Bronco by about maybe 400 yards. The test drive went smoothly, but you ready to find out how much this sweet baby's gonna cost? I'm pretty sure that a prize tag of over a million bucks would break your face. All right, so, um... How much you want for this? A million three. That's a lot of money. Okay, I could drop down to a million two hundred fifty. You might get that or even more at auction. Tell Billy Custom. Chumley gets a call from a customer hoping to sell a customized Ford Model A car he has in his possession. Tell me about it, man. Uh, my actual inspiration to get it was as a kid, my favorite show was The Munsters. Yeah, this does look like it's straight out of the Monsters, man. Yeah. Impressed with the custom build, Chumley asked for the specs of the car. Started out as a 1930 Model A. The only original part of that is the cowl and windshield frame. The exception of the drivetrain, every other piece of this car was handmade. Chumley asked to take a quick look at the innards of the car. Gate latches for doorknobs. Oh my goodness. I like the skull right here. That's a pretty nice touch. Thanks. The customer gives Chum Lee his asking price. Honestly, I need 30 grand. Chum Lee calls in Steven Rayanostos, a classic car expert, to evaluate the car before they make a deal. It's definitely pretty cool, but I haven't seen the flames yet. That's what I'm waiting for. Oh, well, let's light it up. Let's do it. Having seen all that needs to be seen, Steven gives an estimate of what he thinks the item is worth. 24, 25 grand. With a set price to follow, Chumley makes the owner an offer. I'm literally looking to offer 19,000. Yeah, no way. The seller doesn't take kindly to the offer, so he tries to ring a better price out of Chum Lee. You know, I think my top dollar is gonna be 22. Man, we're close. At 22, I can make a deal with you, but at 25, I'm gonna have to walk. All right. If you change your mind, I'll be at the shop, man. Give me a call. I'll come back down. All right, man. 1956 Chevy race car. John, the owner of a 1956 Chevy race car, calls the Pawn Stars over to take a look at the car with hopes of them getting it off his hands for a good price. I had a friend who raced stock cars, and I got it from him for cheap. When I bought it, it was half finished, but I built a whole new package for it. I did everything myself. Rick decides to examine every single inch of the car. That's got a full cage in it now. This is pretty cool. It's certified by the National Hot Rod Association, which means that the inspector came out here and went over this thing and said it meets all the specs for a safe race car. John explains his intentions for the car and the price he has in mind for it as well. The car is worth 55. I was thinking maybe I could get 42. Rick calls his car expert, Danny Coker, over to take a look at the car. Ah. Absolutely beautiful. Before he could truly tackle Rick's concerns, Danny decides to have a closer inspection of the car. <laughs> Not a lot of engines make me giggle, but good Lord Almighty, this is beautiful. Look at that injection system. Can we fire it up here? Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> that smell is delicious. Chumley suggests a test drive, but Danny shoots the idea down due to safety reasons. Take it for a test drive, Danny. It's not something you would do out on the public roads at all. You've got to be in a controlled environment. If the surface of the road isn't proper, one rear wheel might pull harder than the other, and it could send you into somebody's house. Having assured Rick that the car is perfectly okay without a test drive, Danny tries his best to answer when Rick asks for an estimate of what it might be worth. To put a number on this car, it's difficult. There's probably 60 grand, 70 grand worth of just parts list on this car. That motor's probably worth 
40 grand. You build a hot rod, you never get your money back out of it. That's just how it is. Rick and John get started with the negotiation after Danny takes his leave. I'll give you 30 grand. That's just not enough. I gotta make some money and it's the economy. Um, I'll go 35 on it. John, knowing he won't be walking away with the full value of the car, tries to make the most he can out of the deal. How about 38? I'll go 37. 37? Bye, honey. That's a deal. All right, it's a deal. 1984 Ferrari 308 GTS. A car collector asks Rick over to check out his 1984 Ferrari 308 GTS. Tell me all about it. It's the second year they make it into the four valve version and with a little bit more horsepower. It's all original paint, everything. No oil leaks, no funny noises, nothing. Impressed with the car, Rick decides to take a quick look at the interior and engine. Exactly what you would expect from a sports car from back then. Absolutely, you know, sits low. Rick asks for the seller's price before he can make further decisions. $79,999. $80,000. Yes, you got okay. it. <laughs> All right. To authenticate the item, Rick calls in his buddy, Bill Sagrinos, a car expert over. Yeah, this is a, I mean, this is a beautiful car. You've got all your perfect Ferrari ticking points. I mean, you've got your gated shifter in here, your beautiful hand-stitched leather seats. I mean, these seats are in amazing condition. Bill, after getting the owner's consent, decides to take the car out for a test drive to find out if all is in place. Just listen to the sweet tone of the engine, listen to that. After the test drive, Rick and the owner get to know what Bill thinks the car is worth. $75,000. Thanks, man. Hey, it's a great car. Rick and the seller try to negotiate a price that benefits both parties. I'll tell you what, I'll go as low as 70 if we're gonna do this now. My, my really is my top dollar 63. If you'll take it, I'll pay it. I can't go that low, I'm okay. sorry. Thanks for letting me drive it. Appreciate it. Okay. We'll try. You change your mind, you let me know. I will. Plymouth Cuda. Rick and Chum Lee take a trip down to an automotive museum in South California to meet with John Marconi, the proprietor of the establishment, who was interested in selling his 1971 Plymouth Cuda. Is that what I think it is? It is what you think it is, the original. Michael Keaton, 1992, Batman Returns. This thing is awesome. Yeah, yeah, Chum, it's cool, but this is what we came to see. It's a 1971 Cuda. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of the muscle car. It is the Zenith, and Chrysler was leading the game. John gives the two Pawn Stars a rundown of the features the car possesses. It's got the original motor and transmission, power brakes, power steering. I want it safe for my wife to drive. We'd get groceries in it. I mean, this was her daily driver. This is definitely the pinnacle of grocery getters. hundred <laughs> percent. I have to agree with you there. Can we see underneath it? Absolutely. Time? Rick tries to take a look at the gears on the fine piece of machinery they came for. Wow. This is the beautiful thing about cars back then. There was room to work underneath the hood. And when you open the hood, you knew what the motor was. Because there we go right there, 344 barrel. This thing will pass anything but a gas station. Probably <laughs> just like much. eight, nine miles a gallon. Pretty much. It totally stunned by what they had seen, Rick asks John for his asking price. Ready? Ready. 90. 90 dollars? What a guy. <laughs> 90,000. Can we take it for a spin? Keys are in it. Should I drive? All right, this is why we came here. I'll send the passengers. <laughs> After taking a little trip around the strip, Rick makes John an offer for the car. How much did you want for this thing? 90. You sure it wasn't 60? If I come back with 60, my wife will have my head. It's her car. John stays obstinate with his price, since Rick offered him lower than he's expecting. We do 70? Man, I can't swing it. This just, I, I, I can't get that deep. Okay. Like I said, my wife would have my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna drive back to Vegas, go home, talk to the wife, and let me know if you change your mind. You got it. All right, Chubb, uh, let's go back to Vegas. Steve McQueen Mustang. Rick sees a sports car classic that is almost something out of a movie, though Rick has to explain to Corey why this car is worth so much. So this is it, huh? This is it. The 68 Mustang Fastback GT. Is this is what we're here for? Uh, yes, we're definitely here for this. This is the coolest car ever made, possibly. This is a car that Steve McQueen used to drive. It's not the actual car Steve McQueen drove. One exactly identical to what he had. In Bullet, he had a 68 Mustang GTE Fastback. Right. This is the quintessential muscle car. 
It's 1968, the movie Bullet comes out. It was the greatest car chase scene in the history of all movies, and they have no special effects or anything like that. Rick wants this classic ride, but is he willing to part with that much money? Only an expert can help Rick answer that question. I gotta get 20 grand out of it. When this car is like new again, it will be worth around $100,000. Let me have a friend come down and take a look. Sure. The expert comes in and his first reaction towards the car tells us that Rick might be onto something buying this car. Goodness gracious, a Steve McQueen machine. I own Counts Customs right here in Las Vegas. We specialize in building anything cool with an engine. Corey's reservations about the car are quite noted. However, the expert is here to address Rick's concerns. Rick, besides Corey, what are your concerns? <laughs> I just want to make sure it's a GT, and I need to know if I can get it back to beautiful condition without putting me in bankruptcy court. Who would put such a thing on a beautiful car, and why? If you know the reason, then let us know in the comment section. There's no rust rot in it. It's just surface rust. This ain't rust. It looks like 12. How about 12.5? That's the least I can take, 12.5. All right, it's a deal. Okay. Well, he's not going to kill them on national TV, but the surprise is one you'll find hard to believe. We've been working around the clock to get this bullet Mustang ready for Rick Harrison, and after everything we've been through with her, she's finally ready for the road. This is amazing. <laughs> This thing's literally the fountain of youth. If you love automobile stories, this is a Cinderella flick for you. We hope Danny and his partner had a well-deserved meal. Bought the car for $12.5. Danny only charged me $22 to fix it, which means I'm in the entire thing, $34.5. And literally, the car's worth $50 or $60. Or the way I'm looking at it, I think the thing's priceless. Nice. Man, I'm really proud of our team. Yep. Rick yep. is happy, and we yep. made a believer out of Corey. Yep. You hungry? I'm always hungry. I know you are. That's why I asked. Let's go get something to eat, man. I'm starving. Rick is in the presence of a celebrity here, not the seller, the car. This high-performance racing machine starred in Nicolas Cage's blockbuster movie Gone in 60 Seconds. Um, this thing is nice. This is the real thing, not a clone, huh? The real deal. This is it. 67 GT350? Yep. Only 1,175 made total. Be my tennis record. It's Wimbledon White, right? It is Wimbledon White. <laughs> Rick is drooling all over this car, though with its high performance and even better history, it's hard for a car enthusiast to behave any other way. This is one of the quintessential cool cars of the 1960s. There was right around 100 modifications that Shelby did to a Ford Mustang to make the GT350. It improved its performance, its handling, and its style. Needless to say, this is about as cool as it gets, and I would love to have it. Rick checks out the incredible ride, and it meets his standards. The car even comes with a plus. This is clean. This is really nice. Ah, it looks all beautifully stock. That's what I like to see. Yep, original four-speed top loader. It's got 62,000 original miles on the car. Original gauges. I'm sure the upholstery's been redone. Just the inserts in the seats actually have been redone. Well, that's, that's expected to be done. It's just as long as it's done right. Right. And this all looks right. And uh, he signed the glove box. Oh, he's charged for like a, a couple hundred bucks. You just had to give it to his charity, right? Yep. That's the way it went. When the seller rubs his hand, you know he has a hefty selling price in mind. This prompts Rick to call in an expert. Um, my asking on the car is 125000 I've done my homework on this car. I know the value of it. I feel it's a fair price when I'm asking for the car. Okay. The expert confirms the car is in good shape, but he needs to check how it runs on the road. The seller is understandably hesitant, but consents. There it is, the Hypo 289, man. It looks like it's a, it's a pretty well-kept engine bay. You know, this is definitely a car that's been cherished, I can tell that. What really makes the difference right now is the test drive. <laughs> That's the only way to validate whether it's a real Shelby. I think it's the real deal, guys. Do you mind if we take it for a spin around the block, make sure there's no problems, everything's running right? Uh, yeah, that's that's OK. That's fine. Okay. So I promise I won't break it. OK, you promise. Car proves itself on the road. Rick and his expert only have admiration for the rare automobile.
back in 67, when you were driving this car, you were kind of a baller. I mean, this was paying a lot of money to drive a Mustang. Yeah. You could drive a Porsche for the price of this car back then. You know what I mean? Yeah, she's nice, man. She's real tight. The test drive was awesome, man. It's a solid car. It felt good. It's got really good power. You know that car would get the goods when you lay in the throttle. The sailor barely holds back his excitement at that appraisal. He's definitely looking forward to the negotiations part. What do you think it's worth? Well, um, it's a solid car, runs and drives good. So I'd say anywhere between 100 to 110,000 bucks. I appreciate you letting us take it for a nice, easy meander down the road. I appreciate what you said, and we'll talk yeah, and we'll see how it you goes. Got Rick really wants this car, and even the seller cannot refuse such a persuasive offer. Both men leave that transaction satisfied. I'm not going to negotiate. I will give you 100 grand. There's no money past 100 grand, none. Is it feasible uh, that you might be able to do 105? No. Anything past 100? Is, doesn't make a dime of sense. All right, so that's the max you're going to go? Not one dime more. You got a deal. World War II fighter plane. Chum finds an ad for a World War II plane, which he thinks will make some profit for the shop. So he informs Rick, who, in turn, takes a trip down to the hangar with Corey. This is cool. So this is it? This is our 1942 North American AT6 Texan. Are you guys interested in buying this airplane? Both of us have been talking about getting our pilot's license, and uh, I bet I could do a pretty good job of crashing this thing. <laughs> While looking, the seller exposes the fact that the item has been flown for combat. So it's uh, a 1942. It flew in World War II in uh, the Korean War. This one did? Yeah, it did. So did it ever get shot? No, but it actually was a gunnery trainer. They actually had a gun mounted right here, and the pilots could actually fire the guns. So in World War II, this was the airplane the government used to train all our pilots. Corey asks for the price of the plane. $185,000. Before they can make a deal, the Harrisons call in Matthew, a former fully certified combat pilot for the Navy, to come over and have a look at the item. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's probably a, a fair estimate. With the price out of the way, Corey asks for the answer to another concern that plagues his mind. First thing is you need to hang it. That's about $300 a month. Then this aircraft needs to fly. It needs to get lubricated oil through the systems. Fuel, everything's about $275 an hour to fly it. After hearing all that needs to be answered, Rick tries to make a deal. Oh. You know, we sort of came out here on a whim. Uh, so on a whim, I'll give you 140 grand. The seller makes his deal, but Rick tries to leverage the factors that come with buying the plane as a tool in the negotiation. You yeah. gave me 150, we'd probably have a deal today. Yeah. As a businessman, I will go 140. Despite the accommodations he made with the price, Rick and Corey reneged on the deal. If I think we can pay, pay you 145 for it, I'll give you a call and we'll do it. But uh, right now, I'm going to hold you at 140. Boy, we were really close, so why don't we uh, just uh, think about that a little bit, and uh, maybe there'll be a phone ringing between here and Vegas. Have a go, man. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Military prototype hybrid. Corey got a call from a customer hoping to sell a military prototype truck. Oh, <laughs> what in the world is this? Batman's tank. <laughs> it's a prototype hybrid intended for the military. Awesome. Rick tries to check the inside of the truck before he makes his move. I can get in? Absolutely. Don't hurt yourself now. Yeah, this is not exactly fat guy friendly. <laughs> well, I don't think they wanted people to get out of it. Actually, it's not too bad. Yeah, see? Especially if you were in military shape. <laughs> After the seller tells Rick he has no clue how to get the truck to work, Rick asks for the price tag anyway. Asking 150. Rick calls in an expert to appraise the truck. Obviously, there were some guys that put some real time and effort into engineering into this. So you could put a, a small team of guys in and move them very quickly on the battlefield, faster than you could in a tank or something like that. With the military background of the item and all the machinery fitted on it, Chum Lee voices his concern. So is this legal to own? Yeah, I know guys that own Hellcat tanks that actually shoot, so I mean, there's no reason <laughs> why you can't own this. Having addressed all their concerns, the expert estimates what the truck could be worth. I would say maybe twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars tops. Really? 
With the sharp decline from the original asking price, the seller tries to negotiate a better deal with Rick. Are you interested in it at all? I mean, for like 20 grand. To get this thing running is anywhere between 50 bucks and 500,000. It's 20 okay. grand on the table, man. 95,000 is kind of what I got to be at. We're just way too far apart. Okay. Okay. If you change your mind, give me a call. All right. World War II Sherman tank. Rick, Corey, Chumley, and Alex took a trip to the desert to look at an authentic Sherman tank used during World War II in Iwo Jima. Manufactured in 1942 and with a built in flamethrower system. Before deciding if he wants the thing, Rick takes the tank out for a test run. Having had fun, Rick asks Alex's opinion on the tank. I mean, it is what it is. It speaks for itself. Sherman's are the most desired American tank from World War II. It runs well. It fires well. It's got historical provenance from Iwo Jima. There is one that we know of that sold in the last year that wasn't documented to being at any major battle in the World War II, and it was sold for 1.2 million. So at one and a half million, I, I think that's a fair price. After the team takes their leave, Rick babbles through the reasons he can't buy the tank. It's amazing. It's got amazing history. Everything about it is absolutely great. But um, I'd so out of the ballpark for me. <laughs> Thanks, man. Amazing day. Soviet fighter jet. After taking a ride down to see a customer with a Soviet fighter jet, Rick calls in a buddy to take a look at the plane before he talks price to the owner. So this is an awesome jet. This is an L-39 Albatross. It's from the former Soviet bloc, built in Czechoslovakia. There's a couple thousand of them made, and it's the advanced jet trainer for the Soviet bloc planes. There's several third world countries that still use this. Uh, Georgia, Libya. Matt, the expert, tries to take a look at the jet to confirm the condition it's in. See if there's any leaks, any signs of leaks. Uh, everything looks pretty normal in there. Okay. After confirming if the jet is still flyable, Matt tries to invite Rick or Chumley up for a quick lap. You know, everything looks good to go. We've checked the inside, the outside of the plane, all the paperwork. I think the last thing we need to do is uh, go flying. After Rick and Chum refuse the chance to fly out of fear, Matt tries the aircraft with the seller. Yeah, I just don't think it's smart getting in a 25-year-old Russian jet. Yeah, I think he's nuts for flying jets for a living. After the successful test flight, Rick asks for an estimate of the jet's worth. You know, I think as far as value, uh, 170 to 180,000, right in there. Rick raises his concerns about what it might cost to maintain the jet before he could profit from it. You know, you're gonna need to hangar it, so that's gonna be an expense. You obviously don't want this out in the elements. And then the other expense is the maintenance. You need to fly this jet, otherwise it doesn't work. After Matt takes his leave, Rick starts the negotiation. So what do you want for it? I'd like to get 200000 out of it. I think it's a fair price. The buying it's not the problem. It's owning it. It's the expensive part. And the scary thing about this is how much it would cost me if I didn't sell it real quick. If you make a decent offer, I could actually hanger it for you. That might take some of your carrying expenses out of the equation. But it would be pretty badass to own a jet, Rick. It's a big boy sport. Um, yeah, this is, uh, well, it's the ultimate toy. We can start at the low end. I mean, if you give me $150,000, uh, then I'd definitely consider that. I'd go 80 grand, but I wouldn't go no more. The seller, after receiving a shallow offer, tries to take a stab at Rick's ego as a last-ditch effort. Just the more I think about it, the more I think this... It's just too much for me. It's beyond what I know. I really believe if I start getting mixed up with this thing, in the end, I'm going to lose my ass. Have a nice day, man. Fair enough, I hope man. you sell it. Thank you. <laughs> World War II Indian Chief Motorcycle. A man walks into the gold and silver pawn shop and meets with Corey to inform about a desire to sell off a bike in his possession. I've got a really great motorcycle. I think you're going to want to check it out. Sweet. I got an alley in the back. You want to pull it back there? We got it. The seller, Robert, tells Corey all he can about the item. It was originally built in uh, early 1940, sent over to France for the war effort. Okay. And uh, about 5,000 of them were made. Um, they were all used originally by the French, but when the Germans came in, the Germans use them. Corey asks the most important question. What are you looking to get out of the bike? So, there's less than 400 in the world. Okay. Um, so I was hoping to get between 55 and $60,000. The pawn stars call in Chris, a local bike business owner, to give the bike's value from his own perspective. 
it's still history, yes, yeah. and it still has a value. With the market today, I put a price on this at About 46000 With the jury out on the item, the two parties get right into negotiation. Be 38 grand for it. That's, that's a little bit too low. I can't, I can't do that. I, I think mean, I, I, 38 is a high number for me, man. I'm really, I'm, I'm not going to be making that much profit off of it. Corey tries to seal the deal with a price he finds fair. I got to get 40 out of it. And I hate to disagree with your expert, but you're looking at, you know, 50 grand. I really can't go, go back for less than 40 grand. Yeah, I'm a sucker for motorcycles, man. I'm not gonna lose it over two grand, 40 grand. Let's take a plan. Thanks. You want to write them up? Okay. 